Okay, guys, we are going to open up with a question today. I have a question for all of you. Are you ready? Did you ever have a time when you were younger where you got in huge trouble for something and you completely deserved it? You completely deserved it. You did something dumb. You made a mistake. Uh, maybe this is a funny memory to think about. Maybe it's something you'd rather not think about. But I'm sure most of us raise our hand and say, yeah, there was something I did. I got in a lot of trouble, and I totally deserved it. I know there's some goody two-shoes out there who, oh, I can't think of anything. But, okay, yeah, there's probably something, right? And, and here's my quick story, and it's this. In, I can't remember if it was sophomore or junior year in high school. I was in science class, chemistry, and I was not very good at science. I was an eh student altogether anyways. And so we were taking a big test this day, and I was completely unprepared. I was super nervous about it. Uh, maybe some of you students right now can sympathize with me a little bit, right? And so I'm struggling already, and we spread out around the room so we don't cheat off each other, which, you know, is sometimes we've got a buddy who knows an answer. Not that I ever cheated. Wait, that's what this story is actually about. See, here's what happened. The place where we we're supposed to turn in the tests was right next to where I was taking my test. And so a couple people who are the smart kids who are done first turn in their tests, and I'm struggling, right? I'm sweating. I'm like, I don't know any of this stuff. And so I look up at their tests, and I'm thinking, I could grab one of those tests. I could slide it under my test, and the teacher's not looking, and I could copy some of their answers if I needed to, if I needed to. Okay, so this isn't normally how I would have done things, but I got tempted. I went for it. And everything seemed to be going well until the teacher noticed that everybody was turning in their tests next to me. She's like, actually, she apologized to me. She's like, Matt, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize people were turning in their tests here. Here, I'll take them. She takes them to her desk, and I'm like sweating at this point because then she realizes that somebody who had already turned in their test, she didn't have it in her hand. And uh, she walks over to my desk, says, Matt, can I see your test? I'm like, oh, my goodness. I just hang my head low. I hand them to her. She walks away. I can't remember if she said anything or not. And later on, she comes back, gives me my test, and it has a gigantic zero with a line through it written on it. I got a zero on the test, which I completely deserved. But what's interesting is she was a little bit merciful to me because she could have you know, contacted my parents and let them know that I was a big cheater. Um, she could have sent me down to see the principal, vice principal, whatever. She didn't do those things, but what stinks is you know, if I would have taken the test on my own, I maybe could have got a 50%, which would have been something, but I got a zero. I completely deserved it. And for those of you who are in school right now, cheating is bad. Don't do it. I, I got a zero. You could do better. 50% is better than a zero. Learn from my stinky mistakes, okay? So what we're going to learn from today as we continue the shadow series is we're looking in the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 21, where God's people, the nation of Israel— they get into trouble, to say the least, okay? And they kind of deserve it. And we're going to look at that story. But before we get into it, I don't know if you guys have listened to the One Life podcast yet. We're about 12 episodes in. And a couple weeks ago, we featured our friend Dan Sullivan on the podcast. And he got to talking about the book of Numbers. And he was so excited to talk about it. One, I wanted you guys to see a little bit of the podcast. But also, I wanted you to hear Dan's excitement about the book of Numbers. So check this out. So in your course of your studies, and now you're, you're preaching, you know, and it looks like an ongoing gig or whatever, is there, maybe it's James, is there a favorite place or area or if you, if you had, to, it's 66 books, you know, it's the old, you know, you're on a desert island, you can only pick one of them. Is there a place? What is it? You're, you're nodding confidently. Numbers. No, you know, you're putting me on because you're, you're trying to sound. <laughs> I knew it. You're trying to sound. I knew you wouldn't trying believe to sound me. Cool. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not possible. I just Man, know you well enough to go. I'm telling it you, could be. the book of numbers yeah. is just You are like, really saying that? It's amazing. Yeah, that's what you're going to go on. It will say. blow yeah. your mind, yeah. the book of numbers. Yeah. The book of numbers. Okay. Cool. Uh oh! <laughs> Don't make me hit the mic. Yes, okay. yeah, that's right. Okay. The book of numbers, um, I preached through the book of numbers maybe a year ago. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I love this book. I love what happens. Just talking about the shadows, the, the yeah. pictures of Christ, uh, the pictures of loving your enemies and being patient with them and doing good to them happens over and over in numbers. Interesting. In the craziest ways. So I love seeing how excited Dan gets about the Bible. It makes me more excited about the Bible. 
and he mentioned a little bit that there's these shadows of Christ in the book of Numbers, and we're going to get into a couple of those today. But before we do, in case you've never read it or you're not very familiar with the Old Testament portion of the Bible, the book of Numbers is the fourth book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then Numbers. And it's part of this kind of package deal of the first five books that we call the Pentateuch, which means the five writings, uh, or the Law of Moses, some people call it. And Numbers gets its name because there's this, these lists at the beginning. They're counting God's people. They're organizing them, and it seems to go on for a long time, and it seems very monotonous, and that's in there. So it's called Numbers, but the actual Hebrew name for the book means Into the Wilderness. Yeah, In the Wilderness. I thought I had that wrong, but I was right. And I think that's a more legitimate meaning because when you read it, after you get past the numbers, you get this story as they journey through the wilderness to where God has promised them. And so it's actually picking up the story that had been going on in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus of God's promises to his people that he made to Abraham, that Brad talked about years before, that um, Abraham would have all these descendants. Well, God is growing these descendants, the nation of Israel, that he would take them to this land. They're on, getting ready to be on their way there, that um, he would be their God there. They they would be his people. He's growing their relationship with them and that they would be a blessing to all the nations. And so this is a little bit of God continuing that story. And they start at Mount Sinai where they get the commandments um, at the end of the Exodus story and they're packing up and they're going to end at the book of Numbers right before they get to go into the promised land. Now, I watched the Bible Project video. We promote their videos a lot because they're just really cool animated uh, videos about different books of the Bible, different stories throughout the Bible and themes. And they said, that this journey could take roughly two weeks by foot, this whole wilderness story. And guess how long it takes the nation of Israel to make this less than a month journey? 40 years. Yes, 40 years in the wilderness. Why did it take so long? And we're going to get into that, but I kind of have a metaphor, a story from my own life that kind of, as I was studying this, it made me sympathize with this a little bit. And it has to do with getting my kids ready for school in the morning, which is an experience in itself. I have two boys who are in school right now. They're eight and six. The boys, they're easy. If they took showers the night before, you know, they're cleaned up, ready to go. They have, you know, you should be able to do their hair, get them dressed, eat some food, hang out. You know, it should take no longer than 30, 40 minutes flat. For some reason, you know, you're probably dragging them out of bed. You're taking them, like they fight over which clothes they might have to wear. I don't know why they're picky at six years old on what they wear, right? And then, you know, you finally get them into the kitchen and they're dilly-dallying and they're distracted by Legos or whatever. And you're trying to get them to eat breakfast. And at this point, we're trying to get out the door and they're halfway through breakfast. And you're like, scarf down your food. And they're, maybe they're arguing about the fact that they don't like the oatmeal that they said they loved two days previous. And, but today they hate it. And then finally you get the backpacks on, they kiss their mama, and they're off to school. And it's like, why? Why did I pull out the hair that I already don't have very much of just so I could get them out the door? Why is it so hard? And it's this relational thing. But when you read the book of Numbers, you kind of see like there, it should go a lot easier than it does. But for some reason, it just never goes that way. And I know that's just one example, but I think you can you know, just relate that to your lives, that why isn't life just as easy as it should be? Why is it so hard to be obedient, even in easy things? And we struggle with that as human beings. So hopefully this story will help us get into that a little bit today, because that's one of my questions. Why is it so hard? Why did it take them 40 years? And so we're going to start in Numbers chapter 21, and the chapter actually starts on this huge high note Um, they were supposed to go into the land of Canaan and they were nervous about these guys and Canaanites just attacked them, took some of their people captive and they prayed to God for help and God gave them their first win against the Canaanites. So they should be like, yes, this is awesome. We're going in, God's promises, he's our dude. But here's where we pick up in the next two verses. This is Numbers 21, starting in verse four. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. And so 
something you need to know that this miserable food that they detest is literally called manna. It's food that God has gifted them from heaven that they didn't have to do anything to get. They didn't have to hunt for it, to work for it. He's keeping them alive with free food in the wilderness, in the desert, where there's like nothing, and there's all these people to feed. And they just had this win, and now they're just miserable. And I looked up what this would sound like in the original Hebrew because I wanted to kind of get a feel for how this would actually sound. So I'm going to do my best. I'm not great at ancient languages, but I'm going to read this in the original language so you can get a feel for what this might have sounded like in their times. Ready? Hold on. I lost my place. Okay, here I am. Okay. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread. There's no water. And we detest this miserable food. That's the original language. And that's, it's interesting because you read this ancient text. It's thousands of years old, and it sounds just like today. Isn't that crazy? That like you could have never imagined that you could relate to these people so long ago. But it, it literally feels like it was pulled right out of my own life and things that I hear every day. And I just love that about the Bible. Now, <laughs> that's not the first time that they've complained like this. And, and God, he hears this. And do you expect him to be, you know, excited? No. God is not pleased. And this manna, it's kind of a beautiful thing that it's a, kind of the first picture in this story that we have of a shadow of Christ, and I wish I had more time to spend on it, but I didn't want to not hit this for you guys because I think it's so beautiful. But if you think about this, that the people would starve. They have nothing to sustain their life, and God is literally giving them food from heaven to keep them alive that they didn't have to work for, that they didn't have to earn so that they could continue on and, and be his people. He's giving that to them, and what do they do? They reject it, and they hate it. Isn't that a picture of how you saw Jesus' life sent from heaven to his people to be their their spiritual food, to to guide them, to give them life, the Bible says, and he was rejected by the ones that he was sent to. It's a little picture of what manna shows us about Jesus, a little shadow there. But here's where God, um, here's what God does after the people grumble and cry about this. This is verse 6. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. Other translations say fiery snakes, which they, they think that when they got bit, it would just burn really badly. Uh, and they bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. So I'll, I know what you might be thinking now. Dang, God, chill out, man. For real? You're going to send snakes. Literally. When you think, I'm a visual person, right? I'm reading this. I'm like, this is my nightmare right now. Snakes coming out, attacking everybody. This is insane visual imagery for me. Terrifying. And that's, but here's the reality, guys. And I can't sugarcoat the Bible for you in order to make you happy. I wouldn't be doing it justice. That the reality is that from the beginning to end, that God's anger is said to be terrifying that you do not want to be on that side of the creator of the universe. But here's something that's crazy, is you can take the, a passage like this and just read it by itself, and it makes God look super mean and super angry and too much of a bully or whatever, and forget that he has been beautifully uh, slow to anger with these people and giving them chance after chance after chance, and they did not earn his love to be his people, that he is fulfilling these promises that he has for them even though they're continuously rebelling against him. And in this moment, he's judging them through these snakes. And we get a picture here, another picture of Christ in the Old Testament, that Moses is this prefigurement of Jesus, where he is the mediator all these times where God's people mess up. Moses is the one who has to go to God on behalf of the people and be like, God, sorry, please remember your promises to them. And God ends up be, being, showing his mercy to the people when Moses prays to God for them. And in the Bible, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, says how Jesus is now our great and perfect all-time mediator. It says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. 
And when it talks about Jesus as the mediator, it's, it's this language that he's kind of like our defense attorney, sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. And when God looks at us to judge us now for the wrong things we've done, our disobedience, our sin, Jesus shows him his perfect life that we could not live, his perfect obedience to God, and also the punishment, the judgment that fell on him completely on the cross. And that's what God sees when he looks at us when we have our faith in Jesus as followers of Jesus. How powerful and beautiful is that reality? I hope that gives you confidence as a follower of Jesus to to transform your life and, and make you fall more in love with him because that's what it's designed to do, that he is always there and he is always now your mediator forever. And it's what he did, not what we can do, that makes us right before God. And he's there pleading your case. And it's beautiful. And so we pick it up in verse 8, and we see God now having mercy on the people and giving them a way to have life. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Okay. Maybe this is on your mind. Maybe it's not. But when I read this, I'm like, why a bronze snake on a pole? What does that mean? I know that the Bible doesn't put things like this in there on accident. I know that there's a lot of meaning and symbolism behind all of these things in the Old Testament. It just seems so out of nowhere and so foreign to anything that we know about in our culture. And so as I did some little archaeological history, ancient history study on this kind of stuff, it kind of shows that a lot of ancient cultures in the uh, Near East back then, they had religious uh, things around snakes. They believed the snakes could do things like miracles. They believed that through snakes you had this idea of regeneration because they shed their skin. They saw them as things for healing. These people just came out of Egypt, right? And so they grew up under Egypt and knowing about their gods and how that all worked. And if you ever looked at anything imagery around ancient Egypt, there's a lot of snake imagery in that and snakes representing gods and things that they worshiped. And the Pharaoh actually had a cobra on their headdress that showed that they were sovereign, ruler, powerful, all of that. And it represented an Egyptian god. And so if you think about that idea of all these different things they would think about when they saw a snake, because also they would possibly think about this idea of chaos and evil, which we can see in the serpent story in the book of Genesis, right? Jesus, it kind of can fulfill all of those things. Jesus is the ultimate ruler over all the gods that they would associate with snakes. Jesus is the one who takes this curse and is the end to the chaos that the serpent caused in the beginning. Jesus is a picture of all of these things to some degree, and it can give new life and all of that. So it's kind of interesting why they would use a snake, but it's kind of cool as well. And so there's a lot of rich, rich symbolism there. And that's why I chose this passage, because actually in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, Jesus references back to this very story and talks about how it points to him. That's interesting, right? He picks this story, and it seems like out of nowhere in the context of this conversation he's having with a man named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a a member of what's called the Sanhedrin. They were the religious authority, the governing party in Jesus' day. He would have been a scholar. He probably had these first five books of the Old Testament memorized, they would say. So he knew this story super well, right? And so Jesus brings this up. And what's interesting I want to say really quickly about John chapter 3 is it contains a couple of some of the more famous ideas and passages in Christian literature. So in verse 3, for instance, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Unless you've been born again. And we know that's metaphorical, this idea of getting new life, being regenerated, some people say, um, but going from death to life. God granting us new life, okay? And so keep that idea. But the most famous verse, maybe in the Bible, is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him would not perish but have what? Eternal life. I want you to keep that idea as well. Because what's interesting, everybody knows John 3, 16, but I bet you can't quote John 3, 14 and 15, which come right before it. So we're gonna read it. Here we go. This is where Jesus brings up the numbers story. He says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, 
so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Interesting, right? And a couple quick things. Jesus makes a couple really quick parallels between himself and this snake story. That Jesus would be lifted up just like the snake was lifted up. And most commentators say that this is first and foremost an allusion to the cross, that Jesus would be lifted up on a cross just as this snake was lifted up. And then the second one is this, that the serpent brings healing, right? For the people, when they look at it, they can look at the serpent lifted up and they get physical healing. But Jesus says he will be lifted up, that anyone who looks to him, has faith in him, gets eternal life. And this is that idea of this born-again language he has before. This is the spiritual healing that we need. And both of these events happen as a result of human beings' sin. And so the question I asked at the beginning, why do we struggle so much with obedience? Why is life a lot harder than it should be relationally with people? And I don't think it's this idea that we need to have behavior modification, self-help books, and get better at loving one another, because we can do that, and we can see gains in that. I feel like God has blessed people with enough morality to kind of live mostly pretty well with each other. But Jesus says our greater problem is a heart issue, a spiritual issue, that the Bible say that we are dead in our trespasses and our sins. That's our disobedience and our turning away from God, and that we need to be made alive in Jesus. We need to be born again to be made right with God. And Jesus says, I am the only way that makes that possible through me being lifted up. Just like these people got life from looking at the serpent, that was temporary, but what you need is eternal. And I'm the one who makes that possible. Um, I love this imagery that the snakes are biting them. The snakes are the result of their sin. But the same imagery that is the result of their sin, the thing that is causing them pain, is the same thing they look at to get help, to get safety, to get, uh, sal- to get life from, right? And in the same way, Jesus on the cross is a picture of the result and the nastiness and the ugliness of our sin, our disobedience, our turning away from God. And we see that, though, coming on Jesus. He taking the full weight, the full punishment that we deserve for our sin. But in the very same moment, we see the most beautiful picture of mercy ever in the entire history of the universe, where the Son of God, who is completely innocent, takes the punishment that we deserve so that we could be with him forever, because he loved us so much. Remember John 3, 16. Right after Jesus reminds him of this story of their judgment and salvation, he talks about he does it because he loved you so much. Loved you so much. And it's not because we're obviously so lovely. We deserve the snake bites, okay? But instead, we get his grace if we'll take it, if we'll look to him. And what happens is we look at the people in the story in the wilderness. We look at the nation Israel, and I know I am real quick to judge them. As a follower of Jesus, I'm like, why don't they get it? Why do they keep turning away? Why do they keep grumbling? Why do they keep making all these other idols? And idols are things, anything we take and worship other than God, anything that we put above him as our, what we value the most in our lives, okay? And they keep doing that over and over and over again. And God is just completely taking care of everything they need. He is going to take care of the promises he made. He will make sure they happen. They just need to trust him, right? Why can't they do it? And as I was reading that, I suddenly was hit by the fact that, am I really so different than them? Because there goes that story of mornings trying to get my kids ready. Because I could flip it really quickly and say, I feel super unloved, and I don't feel cared for, and I don't have the, the, the comfort that I need in the mornings, you know, the satisfaction I should get out of my kids being great, and suddenly I'm not satisfied, and I have these idols of comfort and things going perfectly that I'm wishing would happen, and then suddenly that's what I want more than anything. And my kids, they're just like the Israelites. They don't like the food, you know, they don't like the water, they don't like the situation, they're bored, they're, you know, just trying to do it their way, right? 
And so uh, suddenly I was relating to them. And the Bible says that God gives us life and breath and everything. But what we do is we take the good things that God gives us and we start worshiping the things he provides rather than the provider. And what's interesting is the story of the bronze serpent doesn't end in numbers. It picks up a few hundred years later in 2 Kings. In 2 Kings, there's a new king, Hezekiah, actually in chapter 18. Hezekiah is one of few good kings that they get. And he goes on an idol-smashing uh, rant around the nation of Israel. And it says this bronze serpent still exists. And the people, there's people basically worshiping it. Like a god. There was these serpent-type gods in those times, and they were worshiping this one, and he destroys this thing. This image that God used to save the people so that they would return and worship him, they're worshiping the snake. We do the same thing. We worship our stuff that God provides us. We worship the food that he gives us, and when we don't have it, we get mad at him instead of thanking him for being the ultimate provider. And so what God wants when he punished Israel, he wanted what's called repentance. It's a kind of churchy sounding word. He wants them not to just be punished and get hurt. He wants them actually to see the wrong in their life and turn back towards him to have true life the way it was designed to live. And that's what repentance is. It helps us see the error in our life and return our eyes and gaze and focus back on God. And so what we're going to get into this morning in our response time is I want to read a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in the New Testament. Because in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is out planting churches, and he hears word about the Corinthian church, and they got all these issues. And he uses in this chapter the wilderness story to kind of help them return to God and respond and live out the Christian life and to correct their behavior a little bit, not because they have to make themselves right before God through behavior correction, but because in response to God's love and having a new life, we should trust God and change our lives and do what he asks us to do because of the great love which he has for us. And so this is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 9 through 11. Check this out. We should not test Christ as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. Interesting that he talks about testing Christ there in that passage rather than um, going against Moses and God, but we don't have time to get in that. And he said, And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the angels has come. I love the fact that Paul is invested in the reliability of the scriptures, that they still had what was written back in those times, and the importance of knowing the Bible, the Old Testament, so that we can learn from it. Knowing these stories, because in that we see Israel's failures, and we cannot make the same mistakes. We cannot chase idols the way they did, because we can see how that went for them, right? Always went bad. And what's cool is, in our day, that's how I see myself as a parent, right? I know I've made mistakes. I cheated on a test. I'm trying to tell you, don't do that. It went bad for me. And Paul's saying that's how we should see the Bible, so that we can correct our lives and realign ourselves and repent and, and focus back on God and what he wants for us again. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer and repentance. I'm going to give you guys the opportunity and me to do this right now. And what I want to you is to be honest with yourself. There's nothing that you are currently struggling with or that has happened to you or that might happen to you in the future or that is a sin that you're dealing with that God doesn't already know about, okay? The idea is that you have to realize the reality of it and ask for God to help you turn away from that and turn towards him. We're gonna do that here in a moment. I'll lead us in a prayer of that. And for those of us who maybe don't trust in Jesus, we don't know if we want to repent from our lives and we want to do things our way. We want to keep going in that direction. We don't know if we truly need a mediator between us and God. My hope is that today you've seen the beauty of the mercy of God and what that offers, but also that you would just look at who Jesus is and maybe be interested and, and put your hope in him and in his arms are open right now to put your faith and trust in him this morning. And maybe that's something you should pray during this time. So I'm going to give you a minute to, to pray, to repent, to thank God for his forgiveness, and ask him to help you see those things in your lives that you need to repent for 
and turn to him. And then we'll close out. Father, we, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to the realities of our situation where we might be turning away from you in an area. We might be chasing an idol. And Lord, I know that when you rip an idol out of our hands, it can hurt. It can hurt bad because we hold on tight to the things that we want in our lives that we put above you. But God, the most loving thing you can do is to, to take those things away and point our faces to you, God. So I pray that you would grant repentance in this place today. Draw us closer to you. Help us to refix our eyes on Jesus and help us to trust you in new ways to be your people, to be a light to the world. And God, for those of us in here who are wanting to maybe put our faith in Christ more or for the first time, God, that you would um, fill people with your spirit in this place, that you would bring that being born again, that new birth that Jesus talked about, and make a, us right before you through what Jesus alone can do, that you would grant faith in this place today and draw more people to yourself. God, we ask this for your namesake and for your glory. Amen. I'm going to turn it over to our campuses.